Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're back for another Fireside Chat, and as always, I'm Dan, but not alongside Matt this week. Uh, Matt has an undisclosed upper body injury, so we had to make a call to our affiliate team, and we've got Kevin Olenek with us, who's been on the show a number of times. Kevin's representing the Sticks and Pucks podcast, so Kevin, thanks for thanks for answering the call when we called you up. No, no problem, but it's the Shifts and Pucks podcast. Shifts and Pucks, okay. My bad, that's why you're here. Shifts and Pucks. So this is a new concept for you guys. Yes. Uh, so uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, we record. Mondays, we talk uh, the rival team, the Canucks. And Wednesdays, we talk the good guys. So uh, uh, we're, uh, yeah, Mondays live, 6.30 Pacific, 7.30 Mountain. And then Wednesdays live, 1.30 Pacific, 2.30 Mountain. Uh, and then follow us on all the channels, including When you Twitch. said the rivals, I think a lot of people are expecting you're going to say you're doing both an Edmonton and Calgary podcast. No, Vancouver. I would. I who's more the rival? Is it Edmonton or Vancouver now? I don't know. I mean, Vancouver's not a very good team, so I feel like while there's you know fan rivalry there, I don't know the rivalry on the ice exists. But I would say that in the last couple of years, the Battle of Alberta has really heated back up. I don't know what you think, but I feel like we've had some really good Battle of Alberta games the last couple of years. Remember the goalie fight yes. with uh, Mike Smith, and you know, so I feel like for years there, I don't feel like the Edmonton games were all that interesting, but I feel like they're getting interesting again. Yes, they. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, the the Canuck games are not as interesting anymore. I mean. Um, I think the Canucks came in there as the main rival for a while when Edmonton was really terrible. And now I think the Battle of Alberta is heating back up. Well, did you see at the All-Star game yesterday, Johnny Gaudreau and Thatcher Demko were beside each other? And I think they were talking about last week's game because they started to yawn. So, I mean, that would <laughs> I could, that was one of the most boring games in the history of the Flames and Canucks for sure. Yeah. I don't know. I, um, we, we talked to, well, Matt and I talked about it, but let's get your thoughts before we get into this week. Why? Like, was that just an anomaly? Is that, you know, why, why do we get such a boring game from those two teams? Well, I think there's no fans in the stands. I think that that's, or half it's half full. I think that that's part of it. That's the, the strength, the length of the season, I think has had a lot also to play with this at the flames being on the road for so long. I think, too, it's weird to me that those two teams were meeting for the first time this late in the season. Yeah, that's the other thing, because they got really... I mean, the Flames could could probably afford to lose the game, but the Canucks... Like, if you're if you're thinking that the Canucks are making the playoffs, they, they probably need to, to win more games. Um, yeah, but there was just no fire. Um, did you realize something? And I, I, th- I you know... Just to, not to go on another tangent here, but do you realize that was the largest crowd that Chris Tanev and Jacob Markstrom have played in a Vancouver-Calgary game since they've signed their three agents? They have not played in front of a, a full crowd yet. Because every, everything was last year was, was empty, and then we had the, that was the first time, and it was half capacity. Wow. I didn't even think of that. And that would have been part wow. of, like, that the, the cheer. Like, even... That whole Tyler Myers, Trevor Lewis hit, which um, Canuck fans like that would have stirred up the, a, a larger crowd. But that was it, it was the half, you know. And it's probably the ones that the the ones that you know are more of the um, well-to-do fans that are paying for those half seat uh, the, those seats, right? The, us who can't afford them aren't going. That would be loud. Aren't going to those games. You know what, though? I've heard the opposite, Kevin. I've heard from some people that, uh, and we'll get into this week after this conversation, but I heard from a lot of people, those seats are available cheap now because there's a lot of people that don't want to be there when they can't eat, they can't drink. So I've heard on Twitter from a few people that I could not normally afford to take my kid to a Flames game, but now I am because I can get the seats dirt Hmm. cheap on eBay, on places like that because people don't want to go if they can't have their beer, if they can't have their nachos, that sort of thing. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hmm. I'm surprised. Yeah, I never, I never thought of that until somebody on Twitter pointed that out on our Twitter account saying, you know, I took my kids for the first time because I could get four tickets, I guess, for a hundred bucks because people were almost giving them away. Right. And then I get, do you want to, do you want to sit beside strangers kind of thing? And 
Yeah, well, and I don't even know if you can. Like, I don't know how they're spacing them out, but I don't know if you can sit beside strangers or if there's, you know, if they make sure there's holes there. I I don't know how they're doing it, but uh, you know, with any with anything, there's a silver lining. Yeah, true. Well, let's jump into the last week of Flames hockey. The Flames have played their last two home games in what seems like forever. These will be the uh, last two home games before they have seven at home. Or sorry, their last two road games before their big home streak, I should say, is uh, two away games for what seems like they're at home forever. Um, And they went on a quick road trip two days before the All-Star break. So they played in Dallas and then uh, the next night in Arizona. So let's break these down from the beginning. The Flames in Dallas, the Flames won four to three. Shillington scored the game winner with a buck 47 left on the clock in this one. Um, And I thought like... I don't know why, but the Flames have always struggled with Dallas in the last handful of years. I'm not sure what it is. And I felt like this was no different. What do you think of this one? Yeah, for the first, I mean, the first period was, first half was sloppy for both teams. And then in the second period, the Dallas took over, uh, outshot 10, 10 to 2 in the first bit, and then two goals in, two goals up. Um, and then the, the pulling of Markstrom for Vladar. Uh, I thought was an interesting move. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't expect at that point. Did you? No, but uh, at the same time, uh, well, at the same time, I thought it was it was a good move. And I thought at the end of all of this, I would say that this was probably their most significant win of the year. I don't recall a lot of two goal comebacks. They were tied in the standings no. of the wild card. Um, I think. Definitely. I mean, Daryl Sutter has said they want to be in the top three. I think it's easier to be in the top three in the Pacific than trying to battle everyone for a wild card spot. Um, So coming back the opponent where the opponent was in the standings, I thought that that was the most significant win of the season and a redemption for Oliver Shillington, who took a really terrible penalty late after the flames tied it and then came back and scored the winning goal. So ultimately, you know, uh, a statement win and they got, they got some needed goaltending from Vladar, who I don't know where Daryl Sutter truly is on him. Um, I think the this is one of those that the fans want more Vladar than Daryl. We may get into that a little bit later, but Daryl and backups. <laughs> you, know, you know, and you we've talked about it when I've been on your show. We've talked about it when you've been on this show. Matt and I have talked about it. I think every Flames fan has talked about in the past, the Flames, when they got down, they would just stop playing. And I think yep. this game really shows that this team has a different mental state this year. To get down 3-1 to one and be able to battle back, I thought, you know what? That really showed that there's some drive in this team. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think one person that is amplifying that is this year is Johnny Gaudreau, because when it mm-hmm. used to be two down, um, you would see Johnny just get so frustrated with the real officials, get frustrated with everybody. It just feels like Johnny's on another level this year. Like he has, you'd almost game, think he was playing for a contract or something. Yeah. He, it's almost like he's playing for $9 million or something like that. Um, wow. Weird what the motivation is, but seriously though, he is. He has taken his game to another level, whether it's a contract year or not. This is a much, much different Johnny Gaudreau, and I think that he's been that whole that Lindholm Gaudreau Kachuk line has taken this team on its back in a lot of ways. Um, I agree. Yeah, and I and Johnny's been a huge part of that. Yep. Yeah, I, I was surprised when Vladar came in, in this one, but I thought when he was in, he looked. Great. I mean, for the majority of the season, when Dan Villadar's been in the net, he's looked fantastic. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I I haven't. I've been pretty really impressed with him. Uh, the, I don't recall a lot of iffy bad goals. I think that this was um that was one of the sneaky good acquisitions that Brad Treliven made in the off season. Uh, I agree. Third round, good third round pick, and then where everyone else was trying to sign that big contract for that big veteran goalie um they found vladar that was some found money there and i think yeah he's been mostly solid but i still don't know i don't know i don't feel like daryl sutter is on if daryl sutter was sitting with us and we were talking about vladar i don't know if he would necessarily agree i agree let's uh let's swing back around to that when we look at our mid-season review of the team 
the next night, the Flames were in Arizona. It's still weird for me. I still want to say Phoenix when I talk about this team, but Arizona. Um, and the, both teams were on a back-to-back. That's not something you see very often. The Both teams were playing the second game in two nights, so they're both equally tired. And uh, this one, the Flames won 4-2. to two. I thought in this one, the Flames were very dominant in that first period. Uh, I thought the score could have been much higher after the first 20 minutes. Like I, I think the Coyotes were lucky and their goaltender looked good to keep the Flames to two goals in that first period. What did you think? Yeah, they were getting Vasha checked for most of the game. I mean, like so many shots. Um, poor Lindholm, he had like four opportunities before he could finally pot one in. Um, uh, yeah, the Flames were were completely dominant in this game, um, probably mostly from pillar to post. Um, I thought the, the interesting decision, I think the, the question everyone is going to come back to is just to – is they went back to Markstrom, um, which I actually thought was the right move. I know that, you know, um, these are, again, I think getting four points ahead of Dallas and getting yourself built into that playoff position. I mean, I know it's Arizona, but you need the two points. And Markstrom and with six sure. games off, I thought Markstrom was the right shot. If they yeah. were playing again in two nights, maybe not, but put Markstrom in and then give him six days to sit yep. if he's tired. Yeah. Yep. And I think only Mark, if, if, if Markstrom couldn't play, if Markstrom said a no let blood our goal, I think that would be the mm. only reason. But, um, or if Markstrom was going to the all star game or something, I could see maybe not doing it. But with, you know, him getting six days off, I didn't see any reason not to go back to him. Yeah. 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 I, and again, I mean, you know, Dan looked good the night before. If anything, you just swap him again. Like if, you know, if you put Markstrom in, you give him the net, he doesn't look good again. You put Vladar back in, you've got to have confidence in both goalies. And how many goalies over the years have we seen the Flames have had? I mean, I go all the way back to McElhaney where the backup was in. The teams played terribly. They didn't trust that backup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're also paying, but you're paying $6 million a year for Markstrom. And this is not a one, one, a situation. This is a no. one, this is an A and a B situation. So yeah, you need, and, and I think that's why you had to go back to him. And what I was looking at Kevin, when I saw that he was starting was okay. I thought of this like a playoff series. If you got a bad game during the playoffs and you're playing two nights later, you've got to, as a goalie, be able to shake that one off, get back in there and do well the next game. And I thought this was sort of a great mental test for that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it was especially all the shots, the fact that Arizona was hanging around, hanging around, and it took late to actually put it away. I think, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a win that we're going to remember because it's the Arizona Coyotes, but at the same time, I think it was a good way to head back into the All-Star game, get yourself in a good frame of mind uh, as you're preparing for Vegas, which I think is a, a hu- very, very interesting game. I agree. And I think a good game to get those two wins. I mean, the Flames are now on a three game winning streak and sort of, you know, go into the break with that win streak. We've seen in the past when the team has gone into their, what have we called in the past, the bye week that they come back looking terrible afterwards. So I think having that momentum is going to help push them through. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I win. And just a couple notes in this game. I just interrupt you for a sec. Flames got the most franchise, uh, the most shots in one period as a franchise record in this game. So they've been setting a whole bunch of shooting records lately. And Tanev got a career high four points in this game. So we talked about Tanev earlier, but uh, you know, I think he's, he's starting to look this year, like the guy that they brought him in to be. Oh, I've been, well, I've been so impressed with Chris Tanev. I, I got um, on Twitter, I got laughed at when Paul Jack Eichel debate was going on. And I said that the Flames should not include Chris Tanev in a package for Jack Eichel. And I got laughed at. I got seriously laughed at. But I looked at it, I'm like, this is a guy, this is a guy you win cups with. This is not a guy you trade Jack Chris. This nope. is not a guy you trade Jack, Jack Eichel for at all. And not that Chris and, Tanev would And I think would've because went. of Tanev, I mean, because I would say because of Shillington too, but because of Tanev, have we really missed Giordano? No, I, I would argue um, this may be a little hot takey, but I would argue the defense is better this year than last year. I don't even think that I that's would... hockey I I think that that's legit. For sure. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I mean, 
you know, we've seen the emergence of Shillington. I'd say a better year from Hannafin. Like, I think our defense in general is better. But I think, you know, they brought Tanavin to be the veteran on that young back end. And he's looking great there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I Just as a guy that watches the Canucks and Flames, what the Flames have got and what the Canucks are missing, it's astounding. You know, and I think the fact that, like you said, it is a better defense – I mean, you know, we can put Zadorov out there and it doesn't damage us too badly because we have such a strong five guys around him. No. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, Zadorov is a interesting. Yeah, and Gabranson. And I think, yeah, Gabr- that Gabranson Zadorov pair, the, the darling of Flames fandom for sure. I took a lot of flack when the Flames hired Gabranson saying I thought it was a good deal for the money. And I still think Gabranson at his money is a good 6-7. Um, can I say that he's a teaser for a future conversation in this podcast? Sure. Am I allowed to let's do that? Come, yeah. let, let's come back to that. Yeah. Um, so after those two games, the Flames are now at their just over their halfway point. They've played 42 games, 23 wins, 13 losses, and six OT losses for 52 points. Um, they are now fourth in the Pacific, but of course they're lagging in games played behind everybody else. Anaheim has 48 games played. They're at 55 points. LA has 47 games played, 55 points, and Vegas 46 games played at 57 points. So still a respectable uh, spot. Edmonton, as comparisons, played the same number, and of course they're at 49. So uh, yeah, I, I think with seven games at home coming up here, if we can own the Dome, I think the Flames can really skyrocket through the Pacific Division standings. Yeah, home has been a bit of an issue overall, but um, this is one, if they can get five wins, I think that's a great homestand. I I don't disagree. Um, so let's talk mid-season here. We're at the mid-season. We're midway through the, I guess, the not the calendar, but the 82-game schedule, because we've already passed the midpoint of the calendar a while ago. So, Kevin, overall, mid-season for this team, if you had to sum it up in one word, what would it be? What's your impression on the first half? Uh, in one word? Or one sentence? They've grown up. They I have, think that's a great one. They From last year or even years before, when this team was down, when this team was out, when this team was out shooting op- opponents – the way that they were the last few games, they would pout, they would sink, they would blame, they would point fingers. This team has found a way to be more cohesive. Um, I think that the words of Milan Lucic last year at the end of the year that there was some entitlement in this organization have rung. I think some some have heard it. Mm-hmm. Um and I think one of them that heard it was probably Tree Living because of some of the players that he brought in. And this team just has a different focus overall. Um, and yeah, I think I think there's a new fresh perspective. It looks like there's, I mean, you're there, I'm not, but it seems like there's a fresh perspective on the leadership group. I think the fact that they did not name a captain, I think, allowed this team to gel uh and overall i think they've they've grown up i think the amount of veterans that they have have helped um i think the fact that they uh, they know the roles that they are to play um and the the fact that they understand what where they are the way that daryl communicates they they get where they are now I still think that there are some lingering issues that I still have some concerns about, but overall I would say growth is, is that. I don't disagree. My, my words to some of this team, I was going to say focused, um, cohesive, and I, I think impressive. Like I think the flames have looked better in the first half of the season than I expected them to, especially with some of the holes in their lineup and things like that. I think this team is, is better than the sum of their parts. And my question for you is how much do you think we can credit Daryl Sutter for this? Like he came in mid season last year, took him time to get through this. You talked about some of the entitlement issues. How much of this do you think just Daryl not taking crap or maybe some of our previous coaches have? I think huge. I think um, there's a couple of things that I think happened. I think um, 
And maybe I'm wrong, but this is sort of in my observation here. As I think that Daryl, I think the organization had a higher impression of where this team was than Daryl did when Daryl got in. And once Daryl got in, um, I I think he wanted some. I think he expected some things that weren't. He noticed some things, and I think in a sense, he's taken a lot of charge of leadership. Like for example. Um, he was the one that went after, he was the one reportedly that went after Eric Branson. He was the one that reportedly went in after Trevor Lewis. Um, I'm not saying that tree is not in charge, but it really does seem that Daryl was putting his, his, put his stamp on the team. I think, um, the, which I think when we've switched to coaches as often as we have in the past, it's hard for a coach to do that. There's kind of brought in to work with what's on the ice. And I think when you have a coach that wants to do that and the GM trusted to, to make those moves and says, well, coach wants you, we'll bring you in. I think that says something about the trust in the coach as well. Yeah. Yeah. I know and they I... would have done that if Peters or Gullitson said they wanted a guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, not only that, I think the other person that I think deserves some credit here is Kirk Muller bringing Kirk, Kirk Muller in, I think as was a really good, good addition. Um, it just a new perspective. It, it just felt like before whoever the coach was, um, it felt like they were, uh, they didn't feel like they were in charge. Um, it felt like they were coaching to advance. Daryl's in charge. And it, it, it was clear from the moment. And I think the players respected that. Um, and I think they've listened to it. The other guy, I think you mentioned Muller. I think another guy that doesn't get enough credit is Kale McLean. I mean, we saw this with Ryan Huskas. They brought him in from the farm because he knew a lot of our young defenders. Yeah. And I think Kale McLean being the head coach down there as well, he you, he works more with the forwards now. But I think, again, he knows a lot of those young guys. I think, you know, Rajichka and Dubé and some of the guys that were down there, he knows how to work with them and knows what motivates them. And so I think that's part of the reason the forward core is doing a little bit better this year as well, that they've got someone who – already related to those players. Yeah. And I also think, um, and I mean, this has been, I think a, one of the year long debates between flames fans and Daryl is, and I mean, is the idea is I think just, just because you are a young high draft pick doesn't mean that you get an opportunity in the national hockey league. Um, you still have to earn it. I mean, yeah. And I, th I think even more than just not getting a, a, you know, a shot in the NHL doesn't mean you're going to be in the top six. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there's, I think there's been an expectation like uh, with some of the players, I think there was an expectation that they would be in the top six, top three. Um, I think just looking at the way Daryl's utilizing our centerman shows that, I mean, Lindholm, Backlund, Monjapani has been a third line center or not Monjapani, Monahan has been a third line center for most of the year. I think right there we might be seeing some of that. I'm entitled to this spot. No, you're not, son. Yeah, and you know we've talked about this. Maybe I'm going to ask it because we talked a lot sure. about Giordano not being here. You know, I know that everybody like Sam Bennett is having an awesome year in Florida. Please don't get me wrong, and I know that you know, you know, there's some revisionist history about what they could have got for Sam Bennett or not, but. Is it actually turned out to be a benefit for the Flames that Bennett's not here? I was never all that high on Bennett. I thought Bennett, I mean, you know, I don't look at the ceiling. I didn't look at the ceiling on him. I looked at what we actually saw and what we we're seeing on the ice. He was taking too many dumb penalties. I think he put the team behind too often because of that. Cause he'd take some dumb penalty. We'd have to kill off. And yeah, I, I think in the end, I think we were able to replace him well, and I don't think we're missing him. I don't know if I'd say we're better off without him, but I always look at, are we missing the guy? And I don't look at this lineup and say, gee, I wish Sam was still there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Also, um, with the team, I think if we look at the way they built the lineup, that's an interesting question, Kevin. They would like to use Sam Bennett as a center. So if you look at it now, I mean, if we look at the centers, he doesn't replace Lindholm. He doesn't replace Backlund on two. He doesn't nope. replace Monaghan on three. Nope. I don't think that he would have been happy being a number four center. So I think looking at the way that Daryl's utilizing this lineup, he probably would have moved anyways. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Even if he wouldn't have asked it, I think you would have had to have moved Sam Bennett. And he's one of those situations where I think he's a better fit in Florida. But yeah. at the same time, 
And uh, we have to remember, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say, like you said, is, well, they could have got more for him or he's doing well. Just because he's doing well there doesn't mean he would have done that here. I mean, we've seen players that go to a different coach, different system, different line mates, and they exceed in that scenario where they wouldn't have in the past. The Flames have had guys come who've done that. Yeah. We've had guys go who do that. I mean, that's just part of having 32 teams. Yeah, exactly. Like, look at Milan Lucic. Leon Lucic wasn't a fit in Edmonton, and partially because of his own – I think partially him, but I think he's been obviously a better better fit for the Flames of what he's needed to do. For sure. Um, next question for you is we talked a little bit about Dan Vladar earlier in his uh, first half of the season. He's played in 10 games so far. Um, let me just get the exact record up so I can. He's played 10 games. He has uh, six wins, three losses, and one overtime loss for an uh, 0.911 save percentage right now. You were mentioning Daryl Sutter, maybe not having confidence in him as the backup. What do you think we see from Ladar going forward? How many starts do you think he's going to get in the second half? And I don't believe he's had a home start yet. If that's I, I'd have to check. I want to think I, off the top of my head. I think he's had one. Um, okay, so uh, let's go through this. I think I, th- I I think Markstrom gets the Vegas. I think Vladar will get one of Toronto Islanders or Columbus. Um, I think I could see him getting uh, one of the Winnipeg, Vancouver, Minnesota games. Uh, I could see him getting one of those. Uh, heading into would you Mark- put him in against Seattle? No, I would put Markstrom in against Seattle. Uh, that's going to be a huge, that's Gio's return night. Also, that's, that's, that's going to be a, that's going to be an emotional night. And there should be more fans in at that point or we're get, getting, like I, I think right now we've got two sets of back-to-backs this month, but we've got a lot of hockey to play from here on out. And I think you're going to have to see Dan Vladar play more. If you think that this is a playoff team, you can't burn marks from out. It's not like in the past where we've been struggling to make the playoffs and you play your starter to get there. I think Mar- I think Vladar is a capable backup. I think you've got to be seeing him, let's just say one in every three games on average. I think you're right. I think that's what the I think that that's what they'll probably do up until the trade deadline, and depending on where they are in the playoff race, I think they're going to go all marks from all the time until they clinch. So uh, I, I think that's also up to Dan Vladar. Like we saw that the coaches had a lot of confidence in him, I think early, and they gave him more starts than I think we all expected. And we heard Daryl Sutter talk recently about how last time Dan started, he didn't look good. And so he hasn't started in a month. I think really Dan Vladar's play is going to be dictated on his own performance. And if, if he looks good, I think Daryl's going to go to him more often. So would Even you after the deadline? Yeah. I okay, but uh, okay. So Vegas, I think we know that's Markstrom, right? I think that that we can conclude conclude that. Do you play Markstrom back to back Vegas to? I was going to ask you that. Your next three I games think... isn't against a e Western Conference opponent, so there's two ways to look at that. There's you're not losing points to an um, to a a conference rival if you lose. But that's also two points that you can gain over someone else that you may not be able to. But that's true of every game. Yeah, but I mean, it, you definitely want to make sure you've got the Vegas and the Anaheim game. Oh, those are yeah. those are the two you absolutely want. Like you, you want to okay. win every game. But so let's go through this schedule then for February. So Vegas, Markstrom. I think this team will go Toronto Markstrom. I think that it, it, depending on what the restrictions look like, I think they can, they're going to pack the house as much as they can for Toronto. Cause Toronto's always a spectacle here in Calgary. And I think they're going to want to put Markstrom in for that one. I'd play Vladar against the Islanders. I would too. I would play Vladar against Columbus. Uh, but then at that point you've got four days off. So that's true, but I don't want to play Markstrom. Like, if I'm looking at those two games, again, if we're talking about what you're talking about, I'd rather play Vladar Columbus and potentially give up two points to Columbus than give up two points to Anaheim. Fair. Yeah, so Markstrom's definitely Anaheim. I, I agree with that. Yeah. I just – and then if you're going to play Markstrom Seattle there, I don't know if I'd want to play Markstrom all three of those. Like, I think you almost go Vladar, Markstrom, Markstrom, Seattle – yeah, I, the games I would, I think I would give 
what are for sure the Islanders, Columbus, Winnipeg, and maybe I'll be controversial. Uh, depending on what Markstrom wants, the Vancouver game. See, I was going to go, I was going to say, I, I would put Dan or Dan Vladar in for the Islanders, Columbus and Vancouver. I think, you know, two game road trip. It's not a long road trip. Um, I think, you know, and again, depending on where Markstrom's at, if you put Vladar in for that Vancouver game, then Markstrom gets four days rest between the Winnipeg and the Minnesota game. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think when we get into March, I mean, we won't even go through that. There's so many games in March. I think you're going to see Dan Vladar play a lot more in March and in April. You have to. Yeah. Um, well, then there's 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 a good section in the early part of March before the trade deadline that you can get lots of Vladar in there. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, you've got. We've got two games against Minnesota here, the 26th of February, and then again, the 1st of March. So maybe you play Dan in one and not the other. I've always thought when you're playing two teams or a team twice so close, you want to give them a different look every time. That's always kind of been been my thought because they just know they just played you. They know how to score on your goalies to give them a different goalie the second time. I think yeah. you could play Villar in Montreal. I think you could play Villar Detroit. I think you could play Villar Buffalo. Like There's a whole bunch of games there in March where I think – They've got to get Dan Vladar some starts, yeah. especially if they see this guy as a long-term solution. If they see him as a one-year backup, fine. Don't don't worry about it. But if you're trying to get this guy as your long-term backup until Dustin Wolf, I think you've got to give him those starts and let him work through that. I'm with you. I'm with you. But... you know, because you can't... You can't play Markstrom, you know, kind of every game, even after the deadline, Kevin. I think if we're clinched at the deadline, I think you've got to start playing Markstrom less to get him ready for the playoffs. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's what I said. Clinch until they clinch, but the, I, it's also going to depend on how Markstrom wants to feel going in because I mean, yeah, um, you've got, well, there's going to be it's you got at the end of the year, you got that three game road trip because you got Nashville, Minnesota, Winnipeg. And then you yeah, got, and earlier that month, you've got the LA Anaheim, San Jose, Seattle trip. Yeah. I could see two games for Vladar there. Um, and but again, that depends on where you're at with LA and Anaheim too, because they're the ones that are battling and San Jose is sneakily in there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, I don't want to start calling guys up from Stockton if Stockton's still looking as good as they are now because I don't want to disturb their rhythm. But I think if Stockton, you know, is... I don't know what their season looks like, but if Stockton's done by then, I could even see Wolf getting a start on that last road trip. If, yeah, I, if they're clinched, I, I'd i be open to that. I, I think... Leave be... Markstrom at home for maybe the Chicago-Nashville trip, take Vladar or Wolf and let each of them play a game. Yeah, the thing is, I think Nash. The one thing is, I think Nashville is going to be battling for the playoffs. Chicago, not so much, but I think Nashville is going to be in a playoff spot there. So, and you uh, know, I think any if we look back at any really good team in the last couple of years in the playoffs, they've had to use more than one goalie. So I think you've got to make sure that Vladar is ready, even if it's midway through a game. It seems like every team I can think of has had to use at least two goalies. Yeah, and let's not forget Markstrom does have a little bit of a hist injury history. So I mean, we're yeah. we're touching wood here that Markstrom is going to be he healthy, but and that's uh, also why I don't want to overwork him. Yeah, and I also I I think it's important to get Vladar some starts at home. Like I, I really do think that that is a that is an important uh, important thing for him to get used to the that saddle dome ice, the saddle dome boards, saddle dome glass, all of that. Um, I think that's that's also important for him to get. So. So he's played 10 games so far, not necessarily 10 starts, but 10 games. Do you think it's reasonable to assume he plays 10 more at least and he's got 20 games this season? Yeah, that's my thinking. I think I, I would say he we, we see him 10 more times. Yeah, I think that's fair too. I don't necessarily think 10 starts, but I think if you're looking at an 82-game season, I think he'll get between 10 and 15 more appearances. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I'm not, I don't know if I would say 15. I could, I would say between 10 and 12 would be my number. The only reason I'm thinking 10 and 15 is I could see if after the, the deadline we're up, say five, one swap goalies just to get Dan some time. Yeah, I know. But it, I, I, it, yeah, I think this is who will have a lot to do with Markstrom and what LaBarba and Jordan single, I think too. And, um, how that sure. relationship kind of sinks in as well. Um, yeah. Um, well, talking about Markstrom, Markstrom's now three shutouts away from tying Kippersoft's franchise records for shutouts um, in one season. We have, what, 40, let's call 40 games left. Do you think he'll get that record? Do you think he'll beat or tie the record or not even get there? I, I don't want to make that prediction. The only thing, the one thing I will say is there are three games against the Seattle, what, three games against the Seattle Kraken? And they have trouble scoring goals. So there's a pos- I do see a possibility of a shutout there. Uh, maybe uh, maybe Winnipeg. The, to me, pit- there's enough games. There's enough games this year after the deadline that we don't usually see. I mean, we got almost a whole month after the deadline of games. I think there's going to be some teams that sold everything of value, and they're going to look terrible that last month. Yeah, I mean, you've got some. You got Montreal in there. I think they're. I mean, they're they're a mess right now. Yeah. Uh, Arizona, um, they're Arizona. Uh, Detroit's actually a sneakily good team. Um, you got the back to you got three games against Seattle. You got Arizona twice. You got Chicago, who might be selling off the farm. Uh, they're a bit of a dumpster fire. Um, and you got, I don't, and you got a couple of games against Winnipeg and I don't, Winnipeg has not been that strong this year. So no, I, I could see Chicago selling a lot of assets at the deadline. Like I think that could be a team that's decimated. I can see Arizona potentially being a big seller. I can see maybe Minnesota selling some of their assets. Like I think in the last bit of April there, there could be some teams that are running on fumes or running sort of, you know, their second, third line is their first and backfill NHL guys. Yeah. I don't see Minnesota selling their assets. I think Minnesota is going to be a competitive team, but Winnipeg I think is a very, very interesting case. Um, I, they're just on a backslide of, I could, I can even see Vancouver if they're not in there selling a lot. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. I think there's a, there's a fascinating, so, I, I, I personally, and I'm going to, I don't know if my cheap Ikea desk here is wood or not, but I'm going to pretend that it is. Um, I'm going to knock on wood and say, I, I think I don't want to jinx it, but with three shutouts and the way we've seen Marsham going this year, I think he's going to, I think he's going to beat the franchise record. I think you'll get at least three more. I'm not going to make a prediction because I, right. yeah, just because I don't want to jinx Markstrom. Sure. Well, if, if, if he gets jinxed, you can blame it on me. Yeah. It's your fault. That one is on you. Yeah, there you go. Um, but you, you know, if there was a shutout, if, if, if there is one place, let's let's be honest. The two games that we would love to see a shutout, if there was two of them, it would be the the two against the Oilers. That would be fine. Yeah, I think, I think the two against the Oilers, but I also think, I mean, for rivalry purposes, yes. But I think there's a lot of. I would love to see a shutout against Vegas because I think Vegas, the team we're chasing. Like I think there's a lot of optimal games as a Flames fan to see those come. Yeah. April 14th when Jack Eichel is playing with Vegas, potentially that would be a fun, fun shutout game. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you, you'd put into our notes here, Blake Coleman. What do you want to talk about, about number 20, number 22? Well, I think it, 20. we'll, we'll get into this, but I, this, um, I think because we will get into, uh, disappointments and, and surprises and stuff, but we talked about him on our podcast. He's, I feel like he's been a little bit of a polarizing figure in Flames land because I think some people were expecting more offense from Blake Coleman. He got the big contract. Um, he's got a couple Stanley Cups with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, but I feel like his offense hasn't necessarily been there, although he, I mean, if you count posts, it's been there. I mean, I think he's had a lot of chances. But I, it's one of those situations where I think Blake Coleman does a lot of things really well for the Flames. And I wonder if you have been impressed with him or he's been what you've expected or has he under-delivered? 
I guess it depends how we define under deliver. I mean, he's at 18 points right now. His best point season was 36 and it's when he was with New Jersey, not when he was with Tampa Bay. Um, so, I mean, he projects to be probably at about that last year in Tampa Bay he was at 31 points. So at 18 now he would project out to be better than he was in Tampa Bay. I'd say right around that same area. So I think production wise, he's what I expected. Um, in terms of disappointment, I think if we're just looking at the score sheet, yeah, maybe for what we're paying him. But I think Blake Coleman's brought a lot to this team. I think he's a he's been a better two way player, which we haven't had in a while. I think he's been able to move the puck really well to line mates. I think him and Backlund are making a great shutdown pairing. I think part of Coleman's issue is he hasn't had one line. He's been all over the lineup this year, and that's hard to get into a groove when you have no idea who you're playing with game to game. So I think he's kind of been what I expected, but I think we need to give him an optimal scenario to be better. Yeah. I mean, well, originally he was supposed to be on the Lindholm Gaudreau line, right? He was supposed to be, that was the line Lindholm Gaudreau and Coleman. And then he got suspended. Kachuk took over and that line has kind of rode ever since. Um, I've liked Backlund and Coleman for the most part. When Backlund, Coleman, and Majapani are on, the team has a really good chance of mm -hmm. – uh, I think it has a really good chance – when that line is on, the Flames have a really good chance of winning. Uh, but I mean, if I was putting lines together, I wouldn't be doing what Daryl would do. I would actually make the second line Manjapani, Monahan, Coleman. I think there's a really nice blend there of everything, and I, that's the way I would go for the second line. I would – I'm partially with you, but the the one thing is every time we want to get, we want to wipe away or say it's the end of Michael Backlund, he just keeps, he keeps staying and finding a way to prove his worth. Yeah, but I, it's not that I don't think he's good. Like, I okay, it doesn't really matter the number. I would go Mongepani, Monahan, Coleman at either two or three, and then I'd go Backlund, Dubé, and whoever as the other one. I just like those pairings better. I think with Coleman and Backlund, you've got two two-way guys together, and I want to spread those out in my lineup. So I would split Coleman and Backlund up and move one of them with Dubé. I think if it was me, I'd go Coleman, Monaghan, Mongepani, because I think you get more offense out of that line. And then I'd use Backlund, um, and in this case, I guess, Richie and Dubé. And I think then you get a little bit of grit, a little bit of two-way, and Dubé becomes the, the scorer on that line. I'm not opposed to that. I think that the those six are some almost interchangeable. I think, um, I I don't I haven't minded Matt Backlund and Coleman together. Um, I just I mean, I just I think one of the things that Daryl's trying to do with Monahan is not put pressure on Monahan to keep scoring. I, I think agree. he's trying to do this. He's trying to get Monahan's confidence back and. And it's, that's why I think putting Monaghan with Mangiapane, Mangiapane can take that scoring role. And I think um, Monaghan could be much more the puck mover. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could, I, I see your point. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. Um, just, I think, you know, when you're asking if I'm disappointed by, by, uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Keep going. No, I'm, I go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking. I was just going to say, I think I would have been much more disappointed by Coleman as a top line guy. When I heard he was coming in, that was the plan. I didn't think that was the right move. I think that Coleman, part of the reason fans may have been disappointed is he's really been playing on, let's call it the third line for a lot of the year. And I think it's tough for him to show really well when he's, you know, further in the lineup. I think right now, based on the depth this team has, the second line is the right place for him with Backlund and Mangiapane. And I'm not opposed to what he's doing there, but I think if the Flames end up getting another winger, I think he could be sort of like Milan Lucic, where he's much more of a role player lower in your lineup. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, Coleman was a third line player in Tampa Bay. I think we have to he was. remember that. Uh, yeah, and and that's that's I guess that's maybe what I'm trying to say is I think we're maybe asking a little too much of him right now. So I, I think maybe we might be disappointed because we're putting him in a spot that's not ideal. Right. And I don't know if the Flames signed Coleman for his offense. I think they signed him for all of the other things that Coleman does really I well. I agree. De defensively. I totally agree. I don't think when they were looking at scoring, I don't think Blake Coleman was the scorer. I think really 
Blake Coleman, I believe, was brought in to compliment guys like Monjapani and Kachuk and let them be better scorers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not overall, I'm not disappointed with Coleman. I think he's been what I've expected from him. Um, I think he's what we need him to be. Sort of like the old Batman thing, right? He's not the hero we deserve. He's the hero we need. I think he's been exactly what this team needs him to be. Okay, so looking back, would you have signed Coleman or Hyman? Coleman. Yeah, I agree. Like if, I, I, if we're talking about this, if we're talking about at the same money they got signed for, I think Coleman is the better deal. Because Hyman's get making more than Coleman, right? Coleman's four nine. Yeah, let me just pull cap, pull up the good old uh, Coleman is four nine for. I mean, lots of seasons. He's pretty much here until the end of his career. He's thirty now, and he's here till uh, twenty six, twenty seven. Yeah. So, so when the new arena gets and, built and Hyman is, uh, what he's five and a half, I think he's five until 28, five, 5.5. 5. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Five, five. So I think looking at the flames and looking at some of the contract challenges, they're going to have this off season. I think Coleman at four, nine is a much better deal. A, because I think it'll hurt less to buy it out if you have to. But I think Coleman at 30 is a guy that can slide up and down your lineup as you need him to. And I think even when he's 33, 34, will be a much more serviceable player than Hyman. Yeah. And I think there's some versatility with Coleman. You can play him in on both wings and center. He can kill penalties. Um, and I'm not saying Hyman is a bad guy in the room, but I feel like Coleman brings something different to the room. I agree. And I think if we look at Coleman sort of being the Lucic down the road of that old guy who's just sort of your stalwart in the lineup, I can see by, you know, 25, 26, 26, 27. Yeah, he might be a little bit overpaid, but he's going to be that veteran guy in your bottom six. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so think, I, I like the, I think the Coleman deal is the better of the two deals. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, and I think with Hyman, like what, I mean, Hyman, I think, I would have been expecting more goals because Hyman is more of a goal scorer than Coleman, but, um, and I still think the flames are missing that right shot, but I think ultimately I think Coleman was the better choice. I think they're missing the right shot, but I don't know that Zach Hyman was the right solve for that problem. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think he needs, I think Hyman probably needs to play with a really good playmaker. And I don't know if the Flames have that type of center there. No. And I was about to say sort of the same thing is, you know what? For every good shooter, there's two other guys there to help support him. And I feel like Coleman was brought in to be that support guy. Yeah. yeah. To me, yeah. Kevin, I think he's sort of the modern equivalent of Yari Hoodler. I don't think Yari Hoodler was brought in here to be the scorer. I think he was brought in here to be the setup guy for some young forwards they put around him. Yeah. And I also think this is part of, I think the other thing that Coleman brought in is, is this, that sense of maturity that we, we talked about earlier. He, he knows how to win. He has two Stanley cup rings. Um, yep. And I, and I if just, you want to go deep and, and again, I think, you know, the real value for him could be in the playoffs. Yeah. That's where, that's where ultimately this comes down to with Coleman is, is his playoff performance. That's where he'll get I, me making his money. I think you're right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if we look at his contract in rel relation to the team, he's making 4.9 and Lindholm's making 4.8. So, you know, while we might be overpaying one, we're underpaying the other. But I figure between the two, you're, you're getting good value between those two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who so far in the first half has been impressive to you? Who do you think the the most impressive player of the first half, the guy that's really surprised you pleasantly in the first half. Well, the the first obvious answer we've talked about him already is Oliver Shillington. I think he's just, he's, he took the, he took that opening spot there that was maybe made for Valimaki. Um, and he, he ran with it. He has, uh, I think after last season, a lot of us didn't even think he'd ever play a game as a flame again. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. And he, he solidified his spot with Tanev. He got himself on the second power play unit. Um, his skating is much better. I think overall that's the – I think we can all agree that's the most obvious one. Yep. Uh, now, this is where I'm going to get a little controversial because I think some people are going to throw 
eggs, sticks, and things at the at their speaker. But it's I good think we're Eric, pre-recorded, so you can get out of the way. Yes, I could duck here. Okay, so I'm as you're listening to this, I'm ducking. I think Eric Gabranson has been a pleasant surprise. I, I look. Yeah, I I'd agree with that. I I understand that everybody. Like, look, I he. This guy is not going to win you a Norris Trophy. This guy is not a top four defenseman. No one has ever brought that. Is there other players that you could have probably brought in, brought in that would have been better than Eric Gabranson? Probably. But I Eric Gabranson wanted to be here. I think that's a big thing. I think that he obviously has a presence in the room. He's not afraid to fight, uh, which, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a little old school. I still think we need that. And he's killed penalties. I think that that's been a pleasant surprise. I think he's done everything that the Flames have asked of him and a little bit more. I, I mean, I, l- look, I'm not saying that Eric Gabranson is the best defenseman of all time, but I think he has done a lot better than I think a lot of people are giving him credit for. I think when he came in, a lot of people were looking at the role he played in Ottawa where he played higher up the lineup and maybe he wasn't suited for that. And I agree that if you were looking at him to be a top four here, I think we all would have been disappointed. But as a number six, I think like you, he's been a great number six. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would I would agree with that. I thought, I mean, I'm one of the few guys that, again, people wanted to throw things at when I said I thought it was a good signing. Um, so, you know, I'll go with good Branson there. But again, for me, it was sort of as expected. But a guy that I would say that I've been pleasantly surprised with that I wasn't um, going into the season. I'm going to, and, and again, this would be weird. I'm going to go with Brett Ritchie. I think Brett Ritchie has looked better than I thought he would. I thought he was just going to be the Daryl Sutter number 13 plug here. And I feel like he's established a role on this team. Um, and I, I don't want to say he's a bona fide Angeller because I'm not sure I agree with that, but I think that he's he's established a role where we need him in the lineup most nights. Do we? Do Looking we? at the other options, I'd rather go him over Richardson. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say, like, well, let's okay. just say I think Richie has given. Monahan some space. They've played together this year a lot, and I feel like Richie has been the guy to go dig the puck out for Monahan to move it around. I feel like those two have he has a role and he's playing it well. I will give you that. He has played his he is doing exactly what his job is, and God love him for it. He I, I every time I see Brett Richie, I, he reminds me of Jim Poplinski. He I, and maybe it's the number twenty four mm-hmm. in that that tradition in the sea of red. Um, and a right shot, but I just they just look so much the same, by the way. But um, I, I guess another okay, I'll, another guy I'll go with is Vladar. I didn't expect Vladar to look as good as he is. That's fair. I I would I would give that. Um, I I would say that that as well. Um, I would agree with you. Uh, yeah, Vladar. I mean, nobody expected much from Vladar because we were looking elsewhere in terms of goaltending, in terms of a backup. Um, and I don't think Villar was on a lot of people's ra- radars, and it was on Tree's no, radar. And I think as Flames fans, we've been burned by backups a lot in the past, too. We've kind yeah. of brought in good enough behind. When we think we have a very strong goalie, we tend to bring in good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of this, too, even with free agencies. I mean, I think I think part of the issue with what we're seeing with the Blake Coleman conversation is we've been burned by free agency before. Yep. James Neal, as a recent example, right? Brower. Troy, exactly. You know, and and even goaltending, Ocho, Chad Johnson. I wanted to call him Ocho Cinco because it's the same name, but not right. Um, let's let's flip this conversation. Who's been disappointing in the first half? There's a couple of guys I'm going to toss in here. Um, one, I mean, yes, I think it's very fair that Oliver Shillington has done everything he can to get himself a position in this lineup. But weren't we expecting more from Yusuf Alamaki? I wasn't. See, I mean, this guy's been injured so much. He hasn't even played a full season in North America. I think, and I'm one of the guys that said he needs some seasoning time in the A. That's true. I don't disagree with you on that. And I think that's, I think, I mean, and you, you may have heard me debate this and that for the years. I thought part of the flames issue with Bennett is they didn't season him well enough in the A. 
I think that that's been part of the Flames' development issues all along, and I think I think that just specifically, I think Daryl called the organization out on it. I really do. I, I think yeah. you, and, and I think right now Valimaki playing in Stockton is the best place for him. I think we were all kind of surprised when he got sent down. I don't think anybody, including the organization, knew he was still waiver eligible. And as soon as they realized that they sent him down, or sorry, waiver exempt, um, I think as soon as they knew that, they sent him down. Like I. You know, when I look at the depth here on the lineup, I don't think that they were anticipating. I, I don't know. I, I think they anticipate one of him or Shillington to stick around, but I really think that the AHL is the right spot for him right now. Yeah. I, I don't like I, when I watched Valimaki in the preseason, I, I saw a guy that wasn't ready from the national hockey league. Uh, not yet. And, I do and I'm not agree- saying he's never going to be ready. I just don't think this is his year. And maybe even deeper, is this the organization for him? Is it a situation where he needs to be like Bennett and he would thrive somewhere else? I I, I do think that there is a legitimate... I, th- I think that depends on what you're looking for him to do. I mean, I think we can both agree Hannafin Anderson is the number one pair going forward. Yeah. So if then Shillington and Tanev is the number two pair going forward, is the best use of Valimaki as a bottom two guy? I mean, maybe there's more value, like you said, as a to get other assets and go somewhere that, you know, he could play that. And I think there's some organization that would look at him as a top four guy and be willing to pay to acquire that. Yeah, I just I I'd wonder if we are overvaluing Valimaki, though, compared to some other teams, but I could see see a situation. I, think th- I, I don't think anybody sees him as a top two, but I can see some GM looking at him as a young enough raw talent to be in their middle two. Yeah. A guy that they can develop to, to some death piece. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe a team like Ottawa just tossing it out there as a, as a potential plate landing spot for him. But I just, I don't know that his best use here is bottom two. No. No, and then you have the question about where you're at with Connor Mackey, and has Connor Mackey passed Yusuf Valimaki yet this year in terms well, of his? Well, and I think again, and Matt and I have had that discussion. I think you got to look at those guys when you say pass them for what position. I think Mackey's better suited to be a five six. I think if I was looking for a five six defender in our system next year, Mackey would be my guy. I would not bring up Valimaki for the top six, but if I'm looking for a top four. I think Valimaki's that top four. Like, I don't think it's always just next up. It's for what position. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. I can, I can see that. I don't, I don't think that Mackey's a top four in this organization, but I think he'd be a great five, six, put him and good Branson down there. I think you got a great bottom pair. So who's your top prospect defenseman in this, in the, in the system. With our weak defense, I think it's gotta be Valley. I mean, they've still got the rights to Carl John Lurby. That's really your only other guy there. I think, you know, I, I think Boltman could be. I think uh, Poirier could be. But again, those guys both need some seasoning in the A. I think if we're looking at top prospect. I really think, Kevin, that uh, um, either Boltman or uh, Poirier are going to be the better defenseman down the road. But if we're looking at top prospect to bring up, I think it's Valley for the top four. And it's either... Poolman or Mackey for the bottom two. Fair enough. Okay. No, I could, I could see that. So, I mean, to me, I, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed by, um, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed by Valley. Cause I think that's where he should be. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you, but I think that there's, there was always that expectation. And I, I think, I think Darryl's, Among fans are in the organization. I think probably a little bit of both. I think the organization okay. had a higher expectation of Valimaki when, when they had. I mean, he's a first-round pick, so I think that that automatically comes with with more expectation. And I think uh, the big thing to me when you're asking about Valimaki, he's been hurt so much. To me, I want to see what he is now. We've seen a lot of players that looked good, got hurt, and were never the same guy. So I don't think we can make that determination until we see a full season of hockey where he's healthy. Yeah. I think in future player association agreements with the NHL, this may sound ridiculous, but I'd like to see – more a more different a relook at how the waiver waivers work because I don't think that forward and defenseman developed in the same trajectory. I think it's harder no. to develop as a National Hockey League defenseman, and I think a waiver. 
I think that there's a legitimate argument based on what you're saying that you could keep Yusuf Valamaki down in Stockton for two seasons. Yeah. Well, I think outside of waivers, you'd also have to look at the uh, AHL roster rules because right now they're allowed four players with 160 games or higher on the roster, including goalies. So again, maybe you have to allow more veteran defensemen at the same time. Yeah. Something, something, yeah, around that. Um, and I mean, it's tough too, because you're seeing a Quinn Hughes, you're seeing a Mario Heiskanen, you're seeing even a Maurice Sider out there um, starring and you're like, why not Valimaki? But I, it's defensemen, defensemen develop differently. Yeah, and different teams have had different priorities for bringing defensemen. And I think a lot of those teams you're mentioning either prioritize defense where we were prioritizing forward for a few years, or they were poor teams. So they got a better pick. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would say that my disappointing player has been Pitlick. I mean, he's been out. We haven't seen him in a while. And even when he was here, he really wasn't moving the needle. So I think for what they gave up to acquire him, I think he's he's going to, even when he comes back in the lineup, I don't know who you take out to put him in. I almost forgot about him, Dan. I, 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 I have forgot that Tyler Pitlick is wearing Calgary Flames colors. Um, like if he would have come in as a UFA, maybe, but they gave up, you know, a, a third round pick for was a third or fourth. They gave up a, either a third or fourth for him. Um, like they, they gave up an asset to bring this guy in. Yeah. yeah and I, he's, he hasn't looked good. No, no. Uh, they definitely got the wrong right-handed shot out of Arizona. I think that there was probably someone else that they should have looked at. Uh, technically they got him out of seattle but yeah right okay but that's that's true he was part of that that the kraken expansion true but yeah i think um i i mean 25 games no goals um like yeah i i mean if we're you know if i'm going to complain about brett richie's no points i tyler pitlick deserves some criticism as well and only two penalties so i mean the logical thing when Pitt looks back is to put him where Richie is. Does that make the lineup any better or is it just a different body? If you've got Dubé, Monaghan, Pitlick. I don't think it's, I don't think it makes the team better at all. Um, do you take Lewis out? Like where, where do you fit Pitlick in? Uh, I don't, and I wouldn't take Lewis out. I think Trevor Lewis, I think Trevor Lewis is doing exactly what the coach has asked for him. And I think he's been, I think he's been sort of a pleasant surprise. Again, you're not getting off. Rzyska back down. Rzy- I think Rzyska stays. I, so I'm, in, I'm in that tell, case, okay, you've so got to find gonna... a buyer for Pitlick because we're out of roster spots. Um. Well, I think the other possibility is throw Pitlick on waivers, and I think it's. Uh, I, I'm trying to develop a hashtag here, Dan, but I think it's hashtag time to play Jake. I think it's kind of call up Jacob Pelche. I really do. Um. He's well, got, let's let's talk about that. So, he's got thirty three points in thirty three games. He's been a he. He's been the, a spark plug. He, he's. I mean, I'm not saying that the guy is fully ready to play in the National Hockey League yet, but it's very clear to me that you know. I mean, what what we're getting between Tyler Ritchie and Tyler Pitlick and Brett Ritchie, who I, you know, combined because I think I was going, you've got zero goals, two assists, two points, a combined minus 10, 23 penalty minutes and 54 shots on goal. If Jacob Pelche gets one goal, that's already more productive than what we've already got from Brett Ritchie and Tyler Pitlick. There is a possibility. Yep. And I, I, you know, I, you know, Jacob Pelche has the possibility to, to bring a Cole Caulfield spark to this team where, you know, he can bring some energy into this lineup, bring a bit of youth into this lineup. He might be able to get, because, because of his offensive ability, he might be able to get on a hot streak. And if you're playing him with a guy like Monaghan, if you throw him on a line with Monaghan, there's some, there's some offense there. Yeah, I don't think you throw Pelche on a fourth line. I think you've got to play him with Monaghan. Um, and I'm on a Monaghan Dubé or a Monaghan Madrapani line, and I think he can provide a spark. Um, do you do you think that playing with Dubé and Monaghan is better development than playing top minutes in a very successful Stockton team? Um, like we haven't seen Stockton be this successful in a while. I think the big question that I've been asking is how important is it for these guys to learn how to win, and is there more? developmental benefit to being the top guy on a top team than being a third line guy in the NHL. 
I think there's some things that he could learn from it. This experience that he could take. But back does he have to, to learn those this year? No, but then again, why? Okay, because a lot of the asking prices, though, of the, some of the players that were asking to get that offensive role for, including Jacob Pelche, are you wanting to trade Jacob Pelche? No. Okay. So, to me, to me, I think it's the better. Why risk that Pelche asset to get a guy? I'm, I'm hope I'm not blowing an entire segment here when I'm saying this, but I, you know. I'll just put this in here. Why are you playing? Why trade Pelche? Why not bring him in to do what he, what possibly you're trading assets to get someone to do? Because again, I'm worried. Like we talked about with Valley and like we talked about Bennett, that you're bringing him up too early. And the best thing for his development is leave him in the A and just don't make a deal that includes him. I think there's enough serviceable NHLers. I mean, if we look at what tree living has been able to get at the deadline on the blue line, Derek Forbort and stuff like that. I think you can get a Derek Forbort on the forward side who's good enough to play on your third line without giving up Peltier. Right. But, okay, and I, I do think the Flames need a defense. I, I do think the Flames need a defenseman more than a forward. I've said that on our podcast. I'll say that here. Sure. I, so, so then again, I think, you know, you can move for that defenseman you need without moving Peltier. I think a Peltier move's a hockey move, not a, a deadline, you know, cap or rental move okay so you're you're you just to tease you're answering a question you're answering a future question for me already but i, I think they I mean, at, at least I, I think you would only move pelty if you were going to get somebody like an eichel who's going to last this organization a long time and sort of be able to offset that in the same time right now i think pelty is the top prospect you're not moving them yeah i but i just don't know that now is the right time to bring him to the nhl to play on the third line I think if Coleman gets hurt or Manjipani gets hurt, you bring him up and you put him on the second line. I think there's more value there in a short-term call-up to learn those lessons. But I don't know that bringing him up sort of like Rujicka and make him a full-timer for the rest of the year is the right thing for his development. Okay, but at the same time, in the what where, where I'm concerned is depth scoring on this team is, I mean, Lindholm, Kachuk, and Gaudreau are carrying this team offensively. Mm-hmm. And they need to find some some scoring in other areas here. Um, yep. And Pelche has that offensive ability to do it. Um, I mean, I guess I also look at if we bring Pelche up, are there guys that I guess would be bef- that would be further up the? I don't want to say the depth chart, but guys who are maybe more ready to be a third line player. I've always looked at that if you're going to bring a guy up, you got to bring him up to the position you want him to be in. And if I'm looking at a third line depth guy, I'd rather bring up Phillips. I think Phillips is one of those guys that, or Godden. I mean, both those guys are kind of at the age where they've either got to be NHL ready or you got to move on from them. I think if I'm looking for a depth scorer, bring up Godden, bring up Phillips, and let Peltier develop in the A. I'm 95% certain that we will never see Matthew Phillips wear a Flames jersey, an NHL jersey. I could see Godden, but I, I just, I don't know. I Godden don't... was here to start the season. Godden, yeah, I could see Godden, but Phillips, I, I don't know if we ever see him in a Flames jersey. And that's fine. So, but I guess, you know, again, if, if they need a top six, I'd bring Pelte up to fill that role. Bottom six, I think you're stunting his development in a way, putting him on the lineup just to do it. I think there's other guys that better fill the bottom six role and could still be some of your depth scoring. I mean, if you're on a line with Monaghan and Dubé, there should be scoring there. Yeah, I don't, and I, that's where I would put him, right? Monahan, Dubé, and Pelche, and there, yeah. there should be scoring there. But one of my other disappointments, I got to be honest with you, is Dylan Dubé. I, I certainly expected more than half of season of four goals, seven assists, eleven points, minus eleven. Um, I certainly did not expect Milan Lucic to double goals of Dylan Dubé this no, year. No, I. I haven't been as high on Dubé as, say, Matt and other people have. I don't think he's a, a future top sixer for this team. I think he's sort of your middle middle six tweener guy. But, yeah, I mean, he's not doing as well as I thought. But I think a lot of people are too high on him. I agree. I I do agree. And I, would I mean, probably... I don't see down the road your top line being Lindholm, Mangiapane, Dubé, which some people thought, or Johnny, you know, 
Monjapani Dubey. Like I, I, I don't. I think he's a he's a middle six guy. Yeah, at I at best. I think he's a second liner at best. I think he's going to make a, a good living here in Calgary, playing on our third line as long as he wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I mean, I know what you're saying about Peldy. I just, I think as fans, we want to see the hot new toy, and I'm not sure it's the right time. And I'm more high on Peldy than I have been on a lot of prospects, and I just don't want to rush it. I'm with you. Uh, on this, for the most part, I think that it's better to season than it is to to bring up way too early. I I totally and get I might where feel you're differently coming. if Stockton was not doing well, but I think the fact that Stockton is doing so well, I think that there's more merit to keeping him down there for a playoff run. Yeah, I I guess to me, if it wasn't if we didn't have this this gaping hole of secondary score, I mean even you know, of secondary scoring or tertiary scoring, mm. I would be with you. But when you have a guy that has the ability to bring us some sort of spark to this team, and I know that Daryl wants to keep this at a 3-2, as many games as possible to a 3-2 game, but you got to find, like the problem is, is there's, they, they have to find offense elsewhere or else, or else this team in the playoffs is going to get, is, is going to face the same problems that they've always faced. They're just going to check that home line and and hope for the best for everyone else. So, Kevin, when I take a look here at sort of the bottom eight minutes over the last couple games, which I have up on my screen, this uh, bottom, let's call it the third line, the the sort of bottom six plus the extra two guys that the Flames have had, but we'll call it their bottom six. That third line, the Monaghan line, has been playing on average between seven and ten minutes a game. If you're bringing in Peltier to play – seven minutes a game, is he really going to move the needle that much? Like, I feel like a player like that, like a Johnny Goudreau, like a, you know, a Kachuk, those guys need to be playing a lot of minutes to really move the needle. That's what they're used to. That's what they've gotten used to over the years. Do you really think that if we bring Peltier in to play that, we're going to see a huge needle mover as opposed to bringing in a guy for a cheap uh, acquisition cost or a guy like Godin? Do you think that the, the output's going to be that much different? Yes, I do. And I will, I, I have a backup here and I'm just pulling this up as we're talking and the name I'm going to bring up is Cole Caulfield. How much ice time did he get in Montreal? And he saw a guy that was able to spark the offense. Um, I'm just pulling, that's a, you know, I, I'm just pulling up here, here. I'm just pulling up the stats of, you know, uh, sorry, Peter, what, by the way, uh, here, hang on here. Um, and you're not discussing this season with Caulfield, right? No, I'm discussing last year with with Caulfield. Okay. I mean, he didn't he didn't get a heck of a lot of ice time, and he was able to produce at a pretty high level here. Uh, so um, you could, I could, I just think that there's an opportunity. Look, I'm not saying that you're, you know, maybe. Look, like, and I think Caulfield's a perfect example of I think what we're both trying to say ultimately here. Cole Caulfield's a guy that, you know, he brought in a spark. He overperformed in the playoffs and overperformed in the last half of the regular season and ended up having to go back to the minors. I don't see this not being a situation where you could do this with Pelche. You know what? He sure. overdevelops. Okay. We, we sort of get a little bit of an overreaction. He brings them some excitement, but we understand that we're going to have to, he's not quite ready yet. I could see the Jets doing that with a Cole Perfetti too, and so I, I, that's that's the thing, right? I, I just I think overall, there's there's an opportunity for that. I mean, the bottom line is I, I again, and I, I just one goal from Jacob Belche is more than what Tyler Pitlick and Brett Ritchie are giving. That's true. Yeah, I mean, let's just say I'm not opposed to it. I'm not arguing this, saying we shouldn't do it. I think if the team does it, it's fine, but it's not what I would do if I was the GM right now, I think, especially with the success Stockton's having. I think I would leave uh, Peltier down there and try to maybe cycle some other guys up. I mean, like Ruzicka, I don't think it was the first pick a lot of people would have had to come up, but he's done fairly well. I think maybe it's time to cycle some other guys through there and see if they can provide that offensive spark. Yeah, I I kind of get it, but I I just are you going to get that uh, that offensive spark from from Glenn Godden and Matthew Phillips? Like, have we seen anything from Matthew Phillips 
uh, to prove to us that he's he's going to provide that offensive up. I think he's one of the top uh, point getters on Stockton right now. I don't have it up in front of me, but um, uh, but again, how much that's him versus his line mates, and I think that's the question that has to be asked here as well. How much do we need that guy to perform versus that guy to perform with Dubé and Monahan? And I think with those two guys, many of these names would work. Yeah, I, I, but I guess where we do agree is there needs to be an upgrade. Um, I think I don't think that at the end of the day that I I don't I think we can conclude Brett Ritchie's and Tyler Pitlick is not the answer there. I agree. I just I I don't know that the upgrade for the rest of this season and if we look at it just this season is um, Zari or Peltier or if it's going out and getting that rental guy. I I don't think it needs to be a really high end rental, but I think there's going to be a lot of sort of third line plugger rentals available for a fairly cheap cost. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's possible. Um, I, and I, you know, I think the other thing though is, is with this team as I do think we need like Andre Bajapani on the road has been awesome in terms of offensive output. We need some offense from him at home. That yeah, and we're also seeing Backland, I'd say, in the last handful of games starting to come around as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think part of the argument here is we have to wait and see, you know, how the guys that should be performing are performing come that deadline day. Yeah, fair enough. By the way, Cole Caulfield, four goals, one assist, five points, I believe, last year. Lowest amount of ice time was 10.59. So... Maybe a little bit more than what Monahan is, what the Monahan line would get, and highest was sixteen twenty five, which he played against the Oilers last game of the year. So, um, you know, and, and I think the biggest thing in in all this too is we know that Daryl Sutter favors veterans. I mean, yes. that's always been Daryl's thing, and I think you know we were talking earlier about Daryl's success here, and you know, even some of Vladar maybe not being seen because he's the backup and that sort of thing, but I think. I almost feel like, you know, if we're going to say that Daryl's the right guy, we've got to sort of trust that process. We can't say we want Daryl, but we only want this part of Daryl. No, but at the same time, you know, I think that one of Daryl's strengths, this is one of Daryl's strengths and one of Daryl's weaknesses. I mean, there is, back in back in previous Daryl regimes, there were players that went long times without goals, and it didn't really seem to bother Daryl Sutter. That's true. And I don't, I don't know. I like, I'm not asking for Daryl Sutter to, you know, make this a five, four game. I'm not, that's not what I'm asking, but I, I think, I think there's a lot of things with Pelche that I just think does fit with what Daryl wants from a hockey player. I, I think. He, I, and, and maybe, you know, when I'm talking about Pelche, I'm not saying he should never be on the team. I'm just not sure if he should be on this year. That's fair. You know, I think he's a great prospect. And I think, you know, when we're looking at that shortage of wingers, I think that's a perfect reason why you should maybe make the team next year. I just don't know that he's the answer for the rest of 2021-2022. Okay, well, that's fair. Let's, so, you, uh, let's, so what you're saying is you're not necessarily going to endorse, endorse my hashtag play, play Pelche. Is that what I'm hearing from you here? I, I think it's a, I think it's a good hashtag, and I think a lot of people are feeling like you. I'm happy to endorse it, and like I said, I'm not against it. It just wouldn't be the move I would make right now. Okay, fair enough. So I, I think it's a great idea, and I want to see Peltier like everybody else, but I just I don't want to see Peltier here for the sake of seeing Peltier here, if that makes sense. Or oh. if Peltier is the only option, I think we're kind of screwed. Yeah, and I, let me let me say this to your point. I think that there has been too much of this desire to play young kids and try to prove the point that you can win with youth. Um, and I think that there is such an underrated value about veteran experience right now in NHL analysis overall. I, that's where and, I, that's where and you that's and one I thing agree. I think the Flames did well this year with building their roster. I think that they went out and got vets like Lewis. They got vets like Good Branson. They got vets like. Richardson to fill those holes instead of bringing up a guy from the farm just to fill the roster spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot harder to make the NHL than I think people think. And it just because you're a first round pick. And I think that if you're going to look at guys making the league, I think, you know, sort of like Pelty, you got to say, what is their role? Don't just put them into a role or put them into a hole. 
where does this guy project to be? And let's see him in that role. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I think we take away, sorry, we're, we're extending this conversation a bit, but the deeper okay. question, the deeper question here is the Flames philosophy overall on how they bring up their prospects and how they are developed their prospects is a worthy conversation. And I don't think we've truly had it. Um, no, and I'm not sure that now is the time to have that. I think we got to look at, I, I think, how Peltier and how Zari and how some of these guys really are handled. Because I also don't think the Flames have had a lot of high-end prospects for no. us to really say there is a philosophy there. No, they haven't. No. So I think, you know, now is probably, since since tree living has come in, I think now is probably the most prospect rich we've been. So I think now is really where we can start to to figure out what that philosophy is. Yeah. yeah. And you're seeing, I mean, I think you're seeing this a little bit with a guy like Rasmus Anderson. I mean, I'm not putting Rasmus Anderson in any Norris Trophy conversations or anything like that, but he is developing into a very solid National Hockey League defenseman, and it's taken time for that to happen. And I mean, Oliver sure. Shillington as well. I mean, there's we. I think there'll probably be some eventual revisionist history about Oliver Shillington, but... He's developed into a National Hockey League defenseman. Yeah, for sure. I, I totally oh, agree no. with you. And I think, you know, and, and I say, I've said this on the show a few times, Kevin, is not everybody can win the Norris. Not everybody can win the scoring title. There needs to be 20 guys in the team. And a prospect who might not make the top six, but is very valuable as a bottom six, there's a lot of, there's a lot of value to that as an organization. Not everybody can... Um, can be a top six guy. Not every prospect that we bring in is going to be our scoring leader. Somebody needs to play on the third line. Somebody needs to play on the fourth line. And those guys are even more valuable now in our flat cap era. Yeah. So yeah. I think, you know, as much as like you said, there can be some revisions history. I think so often we want to see the Peltiers. We want to see those top guys, but you need the Gardens. You need the Pospisils. You need those guys near bottom six who are cheap, who are young, who can play that role sort of until they outlive their usefulness in a lot of ways and then find the next guy. So even I think when we're talking about how we develop prospects, we need to take a look at not just the top prospect, but all the way down that lineup. Yeah, I agree. A holistic look is, is very fair. Let's move on past prospects here and let's talk a little bit about, um, I know you cover the Canucks, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Matt and I talked about last week with some potential Canucks players that the Flames have been rumored to be maybe in the mix with trades. And that's TJ Miller and Connor Garland. JT Miller? JT Miller, sorry. JT Miller. And it's weird because I have a cousin named TJ, so anytime I see the initials, I think about my cousin. Um but yeah, JT Miller and Connor Garland. Do you think first off that those are the right players for the Flames to be targeting? And if so, what do you think a return would need to be? Okay, let's let's deal with Miller first. Um, so uh, Mike Gould put out there on Sportsnet 650 the idea of Pelche, Dubé, and the first round pick. So that was sort of too much. The, okay, well let me let me go through this uh, sure. because I, I disagree with you. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain this. Let, let's look at Pelche, and we've already had the long conversation about Pelche, but from the Canucks' perspective, they already have Niels Hoaglander, which is a Jacob Pelche type. They already have a Vasily Podkolzin, a Jacob Pelche type. So I'm not sure Pelche is a true fit in that organization. Dylan Dubé, I mean, we've had a brief conversation where he is, and I just don't see that as a fit in that organization. And a first-round pick is a first round pick. Um, but ultimately I don't think it, I actually don't think it gets it done. Um, I think if I'm the Canucks, I think I'm asking for a Matthew Coronado. Um, and I think I might be looking at a Connor Mackey, but the ultimate thing about this is, is, is this, and this is where I'm going to, can I equally piss off two organizations at once? Um, I think, that JT Miller is a is a fantastic player. I I I think that they're. I think the first thing that we need to get clarified here. Let me maybe take another step back. I don't think that the Canucks are shopping JT Miller. I think that they're in looking at exploring options of what trade options are out there and to see what they can get. And I think they're and going. Do you think the Canucks think they're a playoff team this year? I think that also depends on this. 
Uh, honestly, if I interpret Rutherford the way that I'm interpreting him, I'm going to say no. Now, that being said, I think that they can get a lot for JT Miller. A lot. Now, this is where I... Um, I mean, we've heard the names Braden Schneider. We Sean brought up on our podcast the idea that the wild, the if it's the wild to ask for Matthew Boldy. Um, I think someone. I think JT Miller is fantastic. I think if I'm the Canucks, I'm hesitant to trade for him. But I also think someone is possibly going to overpay for JT Miller, and that that is should not be the Flames. I do not think the 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 Canucks are specifically looking to get younger. And the players in play, I just don't think the Flames have the prospects or the picks in place to be involved in a JT Miller conversation. So in terms of I totally agree. And I think I think the overpayment is the biggest thing I'm worried about. I think he could be one of the biggest pieces of the deadline. And I don't know I want the Flames to, sort of like we thought was going on with Eichel, be in the Miller sweepstakes. Yeah. Then there was I've heard I've heard a couple of comments suggested on on a couple podcasts suggesting that JT Miller could command a Jack Eichel price. That's what some people are having that perception of JT Miller. And I just think from the Flames perspective, they should not be involved in any way in the JT Miller conversation. And the other thing is, is if you look at this from the Canucks perspective, they're going to ask for a hell of a lot more from the Flames than they are from anybody else because this is for a division sure. rival. And this leads yeah, to the you're paying a division tax. Yeah, there's yeah. Connor Garland's interesting um, because I don't know what the future is with Car- Connor Garland. Like, I don't know if they think of him as a core piece. I don't know. Like, I really, I'm a Connor Garland fan. I think the Flames should have tried to get him in the offseason, actually. Um, I think that that was a bit of a miss for Tree Living, but that's okay. Um, and as I always say to Matt when he says that, we don't know they didn't try. Well, he probably did, but did they, and I don't know if they had the right pieces of what Arizona was looking for. But they were. Well, that's in the, it. I mean, they they for all we know they could have tried. They just didn't get it done. Right. Again, the problem here with Garland is I think it's it's too expensive to come from a Vancouver perspective. But 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 if there was a way that um you could do what the Florida Panthers did with Mike Hoffman and see if you can get another team. Uh, Vancouver won't go on a three way deal. There's no way they would do it. But if you could sneak, if they say Garland's traded to a team and you can get Garland from another team, that's something interesting. But I just don't see Garland being a fit for a Canucks Flames trade of that significance happening. I just. Yeah, I can see that. And like you, and I think again there, you'd have to give up the division premium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And. And I guess the other thing, just we go back to JT Miller. If you're wanting to pay that price, you have to put JT Miller on a in a top three role. And yep. on this team, this is where I'm going to piss Canucks fans off. Is he on a top three role? No. I agree with you. And I say that with all due respect to what JT Miller is, but he's not better than Johnny. He's not better than Lindholm at center. And I, I just don't... I think he's an impact player, but is he a Matthew? Is is it a Kachuk? That's debatable. And I see Kachuk fans think, throw, throwing eggs at me for that one. But if I was going to give up what I think it would take to get JT Miller out of Vancouver, I think I'd rather wait till the off season, where there's going to be a lot of other teams that may have other options for the same price. Um, I don't know that they necessarily need to give up that price this year for what they're doing, and I think that. I just I think if you're going to make that big of a deal, you want time to make it, not a snap reaction for the deadline. Yeah, and we concluded in both of these cases that Miller and Garland wouldn't be a fit on our our podcast either. So we've we we I think it's time to kibosh both of those conversations because I don't just don't think they're going to happen. Then let's do that and let's move on from that. We have a fan question this week that was sent in through Twitter. Um, friend of the show Steve Doherty at Lots to Say Twenty One on Twitter asked. Contract for Johnny Goudreau, why don't we have it yet and is it crucial to get before the deadline? Kevin, I'll start on this one if you don't mind. I've been passing a lot of stuff to you. Sure. Take the I shot. Don't know that the fl- I don't know that the Flames need to have the contract done, but I think they need to be reasonably be confident that it's going to get done. I think that, you know, if you're looking at... If you're... Lo- 
I think the Flames think they're a contender this year, so they're not going to move Johnny at the deadline as a rental piece because they think they're a contender. But I think if you don't think that he's going to be here long term, you need to be starting to make other plans like bringing up Peltier or making a hockey deal at the deadline instead of um, a rental deal. So I think I don't think they have to have the number done or the term done, but I think they have to be reasonably confident that it's either going to get done or it's not and move accordingly. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it would be nice to get this done sooner rather than later. Um, I'm just, one of my concerns is, is if, if this gets to free agency, I don't think Johnny's staying. Um, I think they do need to get this done before because I think the Flyers and the Devils and a couple of other teams in the East are going to drive up the Brinks truck and drop a haul of money uh, down on him. Um but I well, I guess so that I think that becomes another issue then. Do you think that Johnny would be willing to sign here without seeing what those teams have to offer? Or do you think he wants to go to July 1st to see if there's a better offer out east? I think it's I honestly think that this may have to everything to do with what happens in the playoffs. If the Flames are able to win a round or two, I think Johnny will I think Johnny would might be more willing to stay, but if it's another first round defeat and I don't know I think they're, and he's, look, this, like, controversial or not, Johnny has taken heat in this market for his playoff performance. Um, and I wonder at some point if how long he's going to want, he if, if the Flames don't do it again, who are we going to be pinning this on? Johnny. I agree. So that, I think it, I think this will have everything to do with what happens in the playoffs. If they're successful, if he sees a future here, I think he can sign. Um, I don't know if we're going to get a disc. I don't know if he's going to get a discount. I think it's going to take, I think the Brinks, I think the flames are going to have to bring up the Brinks truck here too. Uh, but um, I think that that's, if not, but if not playoffs, I think, I think he goes, I think he goes out East. And I think to Steve's question, why has it not been done yet? I think that's part of the reason it hasn't been done yet either. I think both sides want to see what this season holds. I think Goudreau's camp wants to see that, and the Flames also want to see that. Yeah. So we also had this discussion on the podcast. Who would you prioritize as a getting the next contract done, Johnny or Matthew? Coming into this season, I was actually of the controversial opinion that maybe it was time to move on from Johnny. Um, after this season... I would say, you know, Johnny's been a key guy here, but again, is this a one-year thing because he's on a contract year or is this some change Johnny under Daryl Sutter? So I think, honestly, I would have to say Matthew Kachuk because I think it's harder to bring in what Matthew brings to the team. I think you could go out in the summer and find, I don't want to say an, an equal player to Johnny, but you could find a somewhat suitable replacement if you had to. See, and I said Johnny because... Um, I think two things. I don't think that they, the Flames have a, that offensive dynamic, dynamic in the system. And I'm I not agree. saying that Matthew. Matthew, you've got a year. You can, you can qualify him, and you've got a year to deal with that. But I think if Johnny signs, Matthew signs. Do you think that if – I think if Johnny signs, Matthew's going to have to be long-term or short-term, I mean. I, th I don't think you can afford to do both of them long-term now. I think if Johnny signs, you're going to have to do – almost a one or two year deal on Matthew Kachuk just to get the deal done and wait and see what the cap does down the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that might, I wonder if that's beneficial for both, both par parties, right? I bet wonder if that's beneficial for Matthew, then he can wait and see what the cap does everywhere else and see what his contract becomes. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I can see him getting a big deal for a year or two, but I also have to wonder, I mean, I think of all the top guys on the Flames team, Matthew struggled a lot last year. I think we can all admit that Matthew had a bad year. I don't know if you sign him. And this is why I think it might also be a one year. I don't know if you sign him based on this year's performance. I don't know if you pay Matthew based on potential. Like, I don't know what that metric's going to look like for Matthew. I think you. I think a lot of what Matthew pay Matthew for is, again, comes down to playoffs. What does he do in the playoffs? Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, so, Steve, I think, you know, some different options there. But, yeah, I think playoffs are going to come down for both these guys and what happens in the playoffs. And, I mean, you know, Matt has said it over and over on the show. If 
the flames don't go deep this year, it might be time to start looking at potentially rebuilding this team because we're running out of years with this core. And that's where you might see one or both of those guys move on. Yeah. The only downside would be if you don't get anything for them, right? I think if you know that you're going to not be able to re-sign one of them, I mean, it's catch 22. You don't want to train them at the deadline if you think you're in it. But if you're not, I mean, if the, and the wheels aren't going to fall off the flames at this point where they're out of the playoffs, I don't think they might not be number one, but I think we can both agree. We're not going to see the wheels fall off in the next month. No, I think, yeah, I, I, I think they should be a playoff team. They key should, especially yeah. in this division. Um, and I, I think they should be a playoff team. I agree. So I think in that case, you have to keep both of them at least for this year. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Which is a little bit unfortunate because if we, I mean, if we know one of them is going to walk away, you'd want to get value for them. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think y- you're either going to keep them both or even if you don't know by the, even if you do know by the trade deadline, you can't really trade one of them because I don't think there's a hockey trade to be made right now. I think if you're moving one of them at the deadline, it's a rental. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a hard, that would be a hard hockey trade to make at this point. It would. And that's why I think, you know, I don't want to rent them out because I don't think that we would get the return that would help us for the playoffs. And unless you could find someone to make a hockey trade at the deadline with, I think you've, you've just got to run them and hope you don't lose them. Yeah. I'm, I'm less worried about Matthew cause he is RFA and I don't think anyone's going to touch the cost to qualify him, but yeah, Johnny, I think, and I really think that Matthew comes down to how much are we paying Johnny when you're negotiating? Like, I think everything for next year hinges on what's Johnny's number. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, there, I think, I think there's a number of factors that can keep Matthew here. Um, and once you get that, once I, to, for one more year, I, I, I mean, this all, this will all depend on what, what happens with Johnny. Yeah, I think, you know, even when you're looking at who do you re-sign further down the lineup, I think it's it comes down to how much are we paying Johnny. Yeah. Now, the other the other dilemma in this, well, I don't know if it's a dilemma, but the other thing is 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 the reports from Majapani's agent that he's taken a, he's suggested a one year contract. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but if that's the mentality, then what do you do with Maj? Because if he but was at the same time, you and I talked earlier that he's not scoring the way we'd like him to. So maybe a one year is a good idea to say, you know what, let's see if he can get back to where we want him to be. And if not, flip him for something. Yeah, I mean, he's got, I mean, it's hard to argue that with his offensive results, it purely, it's 20 goals, but it's 16 on the road, right? You yeah. need some four, we need some home goals here. It's, I, yeah, I, I feel I, bad. And, and you, I, I feel bad criticizing. I think a that even I, I would say that for where he is in the lineup, for a team that's expected to be as you know go as far as the Flames are this year, I'd even say the twenty goals at this point might be a little shy. Twenty five. Is that where he's at? Twenty five now? No, but it, like where you want him at twenty five right now? I I think twenty. I mean, if he's playing on our second line, and if we had the secondary scoring that we should, I think twenty five or thirty at this point is probably where he should be at. But that's on pace for sixty goals. That's true. So yeah, no, I, yeah, no, he's is, not, is he he's is he Alex? Yeah, it's it, we're not talking about Alex Ovechkin here. No, that's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, realistic- you're probably right. He's he is where he needs to be. We just got to figure out why he's not scoring at home. And to be honest, we haven't played a lot at home. Like that's we might that's see also that there. Turn around here yeah. as we're playing more at home. Yeah, fair. In, you know, the end of this month, this could be a moot point. True. Yep. Yeah. Well, I think, Kevin, we finally reached the end of pretty much everything we need to uh, talk about in the Flames past this week. Uh, let's let's do Matt and I. You've been on the show. We do our weekly predictions. So with Matt not here, I'll let you predict for him. And then you can let us know about your show so people can hear even more about the Flames talk. Um. Okay, so what are so I'm not, what am I doing here? Predictions first. Sure. Or? So last week we predicted the uh, the games. Matt predicted correctly we'd win both Dallas and Arizona. I lost. I thought we'd win Arizona, lose Dallas. So we have three games this week versus uh, Vegas in the Dome, versus Vegas in the or versus Toronto in the Dome, and versus New York in the Dome. It's the start of our homestand. Um, do you want to predict what you think the wins and losses for this week will be? Which ones do you think they win? Which ones do you think they lose? 
Oh man. Um Jeez. Okay, so I'll, I'll go first if you want. If you yeah. want something to think about it. Yeah. I think the Flames are gonna lose Vegas. I think that the six day break may not help them in that case, and we've even seen them come out flat after the breaks in the past. I think they will beat Toronto and I think they'll beat the Islanders. I think they beat the Islanders. I this it's is a it, tough week. It it really is because I it could go either way. Um, Toronto plays well here in in, in the West, right? Toronto, I, I haven't looked at their record, but they 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 do pretty well out here. But I wonder how much of that is the crowd support. Like when Toronto comes, there's usually a good number of Toronto fans in the stands, and without those fans, I wonder if their powers are going to be muted. Yeah. See, I. Okay, so this is how I'll say this. I don't know if this is the way that we do predictions, but this is sort of my theory. If they sure. beat Vegas, they'll beat Toronto. If they lose to Vegas, they'll lose to Toronto. Okay. Um, Vegas, they is Vegas. I that Vegas game. I, I I mean, I I wouldn't say it's must win, but that would be a really nice win because if Vegas is starting to become that new Anaheim, that old Anaheim, where they're kind of starting to live rent free in Calgary's heads. And I think Calgary, I'd like to see Calgary start making that dent. And you want to get points before, I mean, we don't know what Jack Eichel is going to be in Vegas. I mean, Vegas, but, or how he's going to play, but you want to make sure that you have enough points in the bank that just in case Vegas starts flying with Eichel. I also think that, I mean, Vegas right now is the number one team in our division and that's the measuring stick. Can you beat the best team? At yeah. some point in the playoffs, you'll probably have to beat Vegas if you go deep. So I think you've got to start beating them now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Islanders could be an emotional letdown from Vegas and Toronto, but that could also be a situation where they have two tough weeks and they just take it out on the Islanders too, right? They could, yeah. I mean, they're on a three-game win streak now. I guess the question is just how does the six days off treat them? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, I guess we'll find out. Yep, we will. Well, Kevin, I think that wraps up everything we want to talk about this week. Um, thanks for filling in for Matt this week. When we put him on the IR, we had to find somebody because nobody wants to listen to me talk about the Flames all by myself for an hour and a half. So why don't you let everybody know where they can hear you talk about the Flames when you're not on our show? So Mondays, we talk Canucks on the Ships and Pucks uh, live, 6.30 Pacific, 7.30 Pacific, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and where and it, uh, those places and then subscribe after wherever you get your audio we upload it as a podcast format uh friday wednesdays is flames talk 1 30 pacific 2 30 mountain same channels so we focus on the canucks and other nhl on mondays we focus on the flames and other nhl on wednesdays uh it's sean Ked, tyler chris and i for the canucks sean devin and i for the flames and uh, follow us on Shifts and Pucks. Google Shifts and Pucks podcast. You'll you'll find us all there. Um, we've got a contest where you could win some tickets to the Pig and uh, with the Pig and Dukes to the Canucks Flames game in April, and uh, at the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. So if you're town, that's an opportunity there. We have the word of the week, uh, which you can catch on each of the podcast. Message us, retweet our content, and you can be entered into the contest. And Shifts and Pucks used to be, for those that may have heard your old name, this was the Hockey Podcast. Yes, we ch- we, we we changed the name from the Hockey Podcast to the Shifts and Pucks. I was the stubborn one that thought the Hockey Podcast was a wonderful name. I was told maybe we need to change the name, so that's what we've come up with. There you go. So just in case anyone remembers you being on the show in the past from the Hockey Podcast, not like you got uh, voted out or excommunicated from that podcast. It's the same people, just a different name, different Sa- name. Same people, different name, yes. You didn't get traded away from their team. No, no, I, I, I think I'm untouchable. I, I, I think no trade clause. I got a no, I got a no movement clause. Yes, yes. So they can't move you for a first round selection next year's podcast or entry draft. No, no, they can't. Yes, no. So they can't trade me for a Mike Gould. No. There you go. They can't can't trade you because they don't like your opinion. You're you're there for life. I for life. Too sweet. There you go. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Kevin. It's always great to chat with you. And I thought some really great discussion this week. As always, if anybody wants to chime in on this, maybe you want to tell us your thoughts on on Zari or Peltier or any of these guys. Maybe you want to let us know who your 
disappointment of the first half is or who you're pleasantly surprised by, uh, we're on social media as well. Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. On Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. You can find us on our website, firesidechat.ca. Our YouTube is linked from there. And of course, you can email us and you can do that through the website at firesidechat.ca. Just hit the contact button and you'll see both our phone number and our email address if you want to send us a message. So we'd love to hear from you and continue this conversation. Otherwise, I guess I'll do Matt's part at the end of the show. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.